We're in Luke chapter 4. Before we get there, I um, did want to say that, in, I may I already shared this, but uh, in Kauai, I didn't bring this Bible because it, it, and it adds weight. So um, I opened the drawer in our uh, hotel, and sure enough, there was a Gideon Bible. I uh, used it all week, brought it to church, and it was the same translation the pastor was preaching from. So go figure. Uh, a true blessing. Um, we're going to be in Luke 4 before we get there. Uh, today is uh, uniquely a day of prayer, declared so by the President of the United States. Um, think of that throughout the day as in your spare moments. Instead of thinking about the bird tweeting outside, you may think of tweeting a prayer. How do you like that? I thought that was a good connect. Um, pray for Courtney. She wasn't feeling well. Man, that's going to kill me. You should just take that down. We haven't even started yet. Yeah. I'm going to put, put this here. Otherwise, I'll never quit. Uh, the Zapplas, uh, both Steve and Jackie weren't feeling well. Uh, neither one made claims to the uh, corona uh, buyers. Um, we need to uh, pray for uh, the Ruiz family. Um, uh, I know that Stephanie's still dealing with the loss of her father, and of course, uh, uh, Chris was one of Josh's three mentors, and uh, two of the mentors are dead. You better pray for me, because I'm the third. <laughs> uh, and Debbie Stanley's mother died this Saturday. There's a memorial service for her. And uh, just to pray for sanity, just sanity, just sanity. So I'm going to read the scriptures in Luke 4. Stand with me, Luke 4, starting in verse 22. And uh, as a precursor, just to say, uh, this passage, uh, starting in verse 22, comes in like a lamb and goes out like a lion. So there you go. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only in Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things, and they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. All right, you may be seated. Let's, let's pray. Father, you're good all the time. Uh, we give this time to you this morning. Uh, knowing that uh, we are a, a, uh, a chosen group, uh, not in the sense that we're more special than anybody else, but we're special in your sight, and you're special to us, and you have made all of that special, and, and we, we know that you love us, and uh, we love you in return. Uh, today, we pray for sanity in our country, sanity in the world. Uh, this is a day of prayer, and we uh, do our part um, as much as we can to... Uh, uh, embrace that and participate in it. We do pray for those unable to join us this morning, uh, specifically due to sickness, uh, and in some cases like the Ruiz family where the father has just gotten off, the wor off of work a couple hours ago and is probably trying to keep his eyes open as he uh, squeezes his kids. We pray for the Ruiz family and the Stanleys. Uh, we pray for sanity in our nation. We pray for us this morning that we would have ears to hear the truths which you have prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. We commit our way to you in the name of the Master, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Verse 22 is a long journey. 
And all were speaking well of Jesus, and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not the son of Joseph? It is what it says, but there's verbiage in here that makes the story broader. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, grammar, and I do that from time to time because it's amazing to me how sometimes I will miss something. And yesterday, after having read this passage, pa passage several times in the course of the week, all of a sudden it hit me as I was sitting there in my chair at about 9 o'clock Saturday morning that there are imperfects in here. And the crowd went wild. Yay, the perfect. Well, you know the aorist tense. I've mentioned that enough, and, and you can see it's in red in your notes. It means it's a, it's a point in time. Uh, another term for it is punctilium. It's a point in time. It's a piece of history. I sat. Okay, I, I did that when I came in. I, I sat. That's aorist. There's the perfect tense which is uh, in purple, which you're not going to find in today's notes because there are no perfects in there. But it means that something started at a point in time and it continues to now. And we've seen that at various times in the scriptures and, it, and in some cases it, it has tremendous uh, impact, uh, spiritual impact. It's like I was saved and it, it's perfect tense because it started at a point in time you know, when I was six years old, and it continues to this day. Praise the Lord. That's a perfect tense. Um, the imperfect. So I sat, aorist. Uh, I have been sitting. <clears throat> okay, that, and if we hadn't stood up for uh, the re scripture reading, you would have been sitting from, say, uh, 9 o'clock. And that would be a perfect tense. I have been sitting. The imperfect is a little different. It uh, tells a different story than both of those. It is an action that has an indefinite uh, uh, beginning and end, but moves the story along. And it's used three times in, in on uh, the on the uh, da -da 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 -da. three times in the in the first in the first verse. Uh, which means that uh, uh, you can read it there in the difference between the, uh, the uh, uh, New American Standard and Lenski is uh, they were giving, they were speaking well. It, it, it was a, uh, uh, a rumble before church started. Uh, people didn't just say one thing. There was a, a, con, a connection, a, a continuation. Uh, yeah, I heard about Jesus. Well, I have too. Yeah, and I heard this, and yeah, me too. They were, they were uh, giving testimony to him. It wasn't just once. It was that, that was the action that was taking place. They were marveling at his words of grace. We'll get, we'll get to those in a moment, but... They were, and marveling, it's, it's uh, to wonder, to be filled with wonder, ad admiration, astonishment. I mean, honestly, I have, I've never really heard <clears throat> any of you come to me with uh, marveling at the, at the things I said. Way! Whoa, whoa, you said that! It was amazing! Well, okay, maybe somebody did. I... Yes, we have. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Um, but this word is really kept for the amazement, the astounding response to, wow, I've never thought of that before. Wow, I've never thought of that before. And on it goes. And we have those moments. I've, I've had those moments. Uh, even as I sit and listen to the scriptures uh, speak back to me, it's like, it's like yesterday morning. It's like, wow, Lord. All were giving testimony to him. And it wasn't that they were facing him and giving it to him. It was uh, he was the recipient of that, of that witness. And they were marveling 
What were they astounded at? Now you gotta you gotta hear this. At the words of grace proceeding out of his mouth. Now when you talk about my sermons, if you refer to me, you would probably say would probably say, Well, Wayne said this morning. You probably would not say, uh, the words that proceeded out of Wayne's mouth this morning did this to me. You, you probably wouldn't say that. It is an unusual way of expressing something. And as I sat there and I <clears throat> understood that these were imperfects, and then I realized there is an impact here. There's, <coughs> there's two impacts. The one is, the first is, why am I losing my voice? <clears throat> Sorry. For those of you who are wondering, it's coffee. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, there's stories. Anyway. The first is the emphasis upon his amazing rhetoric, the attitude that went along with it, the ability the content, and so on. They were giving testimony to the amazing content of the messages and the proverbs and the uh, well-versedness of the scriptures and the application in their lives. They were testifying to it. Yeah, that really made sense. Yeah, I can see how that's true. Yeah, I'd never thought of that before. So there was a connection with them regarding that. There was a second thing. They recognized and acknowledged it. They were wowed by it. They were marveling. The words of grace, and you can see the definition of, uh, of grace, it's the uh, uh, charm, the beauty, the, beauty the, the gracefulness, the things uh, spoken that, um, I mean, you know that if you listen to anything out there, there's a lot of negative rhetoric. And this wouldn't have been uh, negative rhetoric except talking about you as a sinner, and that's just the truth. So uh, there was a problem, though. Um, they were wowed by it. But it wasn't sufficient because um, there was a second part to it, and it's the third imperfect. You see that uh, in the, the yellow, the ands, which I keep telling you carries the uh, story along. There's a new thought added. So the first and is, is, the, is the positive uh, aspect. The second and, which is still in the same verse, and it seems like it's just another another thing but and they were saying in other words just as there had been giving testimony and there had been marveling now they were there was something else added to this and and we miss it uh, usually because uh, we just do we just read it in the English and it sounds like something else is going on but there is something else going on they were saying is not this the son of Joseph the way it's written, and I have it there in, uh, in the um, gray, the not is emphasized to the point that we understand the answer is yes. It's like, am I up here? And the answer would be, in modern parlance, no, duh, uh, yes, in other words. No duh. I'll have to think about that. So, in, in Mark, and I'll be in Mark twice. Uh, in Mark chapter 6, in verse 2 of chapter 6 of Mark. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is this not 
the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And then Mark adds a little statement, and they took offense at him. We know this guy. And that's kind of the, the transition from, wow, he, what he said was amazing, and um, oh, those words just hit me, and, and all of a sudden they were saying, wait, isn't this Joseph's son? And everything changes with that statement. He is only one of us. What makes him so special? That's verse 22. So Jesus is responding to their thoughts and demands. Now remember, they, the whole setting here, here is it's the Sabbath, and we do good on the Sabbath, and we're in church or synagogue, and we're hearing the word, and we're hearing our little preaching, and we read that in verse uh, 21 today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, and you would have heard a pin drop because Jesus just claimed to be the Messiah, that statement. So, just as we've read in other portions of the scripture, uh, Jesus knows their thoughts, and he can read their body language, and he knows what's going on. So, he uh, responds to their thoughts and their and their demands. Now, we haven't heard any demands, have we? Jesus is going to address that. He said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal thyself. So the word there is actually parable, but it can also be translated as a proverb or an adage. Remember the old adage? A penny in time? No, a stitch in time saves nine. No, a penny saved is a dollar earned. I don't know. I don't know any adages. So we'll leave that. Um, it's a proverb or an adage. And his, his statement is to take care of business at home first. If you're a physician and your family's sick and you're out treating everybody else, what's going on, buddy? Physician, heal thyself. Here you are. You're one of us. Take care of us. Meet our needs. Hello. We're talking to you without actually verbalizing it, but that's our heart attitude. And he has, he adds to that when he says, whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, you do, that's an imperative, here in your hometown also, or as well. Now, I told you I'd be in Mark twice. I'm going back to Mark for the uh, second and last time, Mark chapter 1. And I'm going to read to you uh, one account that took place in Capernaum, starting in Mark chapter 1, verse 21. And they went into, into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And just then... There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, <coughs> and I thought about reading it in the voice of the unclean spirit, and then it frightened me <laughs> tremendously. So I'm going to read it in Wayne Lidbeck's voice. Um, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately the news about him went out everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. Now, because we already know that Luke doesn't give, give the um, chronological presentation of Jesus, but Matthew and Mark do, we know that this took place before the account of what we're reading 
in uh, Luke 4. And it's also a part of what the people already know. Because Capernaum isn't that far from Nazareth. And uh, Nazareth and Capernaum and Cana, they're, they're all a part of Galilee. So it's kind of like San Luis Obispo County. In a sense, we don't know or care about what's going on in Kern County. But we do in San Luis County. It's the same kind of thought. So... If you can imagine being in synagogue and all of a sudden a demon-possessed person reveals itself um, and Jesus, the, the uh, pastor, uh, casts the demon out, do you think anybody would talk about that over their noon meal? <clears throat> and maybe over lunch on Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday again. Um, and you can imagine how that news spread. Hey, we were at church last Sunday. That was so cool. The pastor cast out a demon. Man. Please don't. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, what he is saying in verse 23 is, I know your thoughts. And I know your demands. You want me to do the same things here as I did in Capernaum. Now, that is a lack of belief on their part. So he responds uh, as an answer to their thoughts. He said um, in verse 24, I say to you, Amen. Amen is a word we recognize from the Hebrew, and it means truly so, or Verily, verily, as is the King James, and we we are aware of that from uh, our King James days. Verily, verily, I say unto you, and that was just a, a a Bible term. You know, in any Bible you read, it was always verily, verily, I say unto you, and you kind of scratch your head and say, uh, okay, we don't talk like that today. I guess that's good, but it's different with Jesus when he says truly. He is making a statement that is an amen from heaven. It's not just uh, a teacher yelling at an unruly classroom, listen to me. It's a person with authority, and that's when he says, I say. That's, that's the authority. The veracity of it comes in the amen. So, and in a sense, we find that in the last chapters of the book of the Revelation. Where the words that are spoken, the words that you hear, the words that I have said are faithful and true. He said, God says that more than once. And it's like, why would we question that? But Jesus starts with that. He says, amen, or truly, I say to you, and that's my authority. No prophet is welcome in his hometown. I know you guys, and you don't respect me. You don't respect what I just said. You do not but respect, i.e. believe, that I am the Messiah. Now, he goes on to verse 25, and there, the first word in that is a uh, two-letter and, which is better translated here, as you heard me read in the uh, scripture reading this morning, but works, but works works. It's an adversity. Uh, I like nevertheless. It, it just, I don't know, adds something for me. Uh, same word. So, but, and so despite their response of questioning and lack of belief, he is still giving them this assurance. God's grace and mercy have a place. He chooses how and when to display, to display it. So, in verse 25, he says, uh, Nevertheless, I say, and that's his authority, I say of a truth. And once again, he is giving veracity. Whatever he says is true, uh, faithful and true. So he shares this story from, from the Old Testament. And you can go back and read it in 1 Kings chapter 17. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine, and the Greek word is megas, so mega famine, does that work for you? I've never looked at it that way and then 
I looked and oh, words mega, cool. So great works. When a uh, great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent <clears throat> to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Now, Sidon was a pagan land. It was on the far side of Israel. He was on the other side of Israel. Remember at the, uh, at the creek, uh, Chinnereth? And the ravens and the creek, he was sustained by the food that was brought him by ravens. And then the creek ran out. And God said, I'm going to take care of you in an unusual manner. I want you to go to a pagan land, to a pagan woman, and I want you to live with her. She's going to take care of you. Wow, it's like three strikes and you're out. And that was like strike four. Because in order to get there, he had to cross through the very land in which they've already said, we're going to kill you on sight. So he gets there. And you know the whole story. It's a great story. Read it in 1 Kings 17. And he is ministered to, and the woman's life is transformed. He is sustained, she is sustained, her son is sustained. Miracles happen. Why did God choose a widow in Zarephath when there were who knows how many thousands of widows in Israel? Well, do you know the mind of God? I don't know the mind of God. I just know that that woman who would have no hope whatsoever, either in this world as a widow and as a poor widow, and one who was ready to die, as well as a pagan, the light came to her. Second story, and there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman of Syria, who was Naaman. Well, as opposed to the widow in, in Zarephath, who was a nobody, Naaman was a somebody. In fact, he was what you would almost call the chancellor. There was a king, yes, but he was the man who made the king stay as king. Naaman was powerful. And uh, he went down to Israel to get cleansed because he heard there was somebody down there who could do it. He shows up at Elisha's door, and Elisha doesn't even come to the door. He just tells him what to do. And he tells him to do something amazing, that is crazy, go dunk yourself seven times in a dirty river called Jordan. And he himself says, aren't there clean rivers in Syria I could go even drink from? Who wants to go in the ugh, Jordan? And he's convinced and comes out the seventh time and he has baby skin. He was a pagan. He was a man who could have killed thousands of Israelites. He was an enemy of the nation. And yet God's grace and mercy reached into his life in Syria, again, a place that the light wouldn't shine in. And he said, there is no God but the God of, of Israel. And I'm going to have a problem because i got to go. The king holds my hand when we go into the temple to word to uh, worship Chinnereth or whatever the God's name was. And he said, I have to go, but I will worship Yahweh. So what is he saying? So he says, um, a widow uh, in Zarephath, a pagan outside of God's land and people, Naaman, a Syrian general opposed to God's people and a pagan, uh, what we find in this story is that God does not reach out on the basis of nationality or connection, either to power or to money or position or anything else. God reaches out because he's a God of grace and mercy. Can you imagine if God didn't reach out to you where you would be today? Man. So we get to verse 28, 
And we find that uh, we could label this the people responded. And all, and all in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. I've tried again and again to think about what, what I could say to you that would cause you to be filled with rage. And I know you love Kathy and I, so I could probably say quite a bit and still not get your, uh, your hackles up. I know I could disappoint you by things I said, but what could I say that would fill you with absolute murderous rage? Can you imagine me preaching a sermon? Well, I, again, I can't. But all of you rising up, grabbing me, throwing me out the door, taking me to the top of Park Hill Hill, <laughs> wherever that is, <laughs> and casting me off. That would be frightening. The people respond. And in verse 29, this is what they did. They rose up. And remember, they were all cross-legged on the floor. You imagine, it's like on the count of three, everybody get up. One, two, three, and everybody gets up. And they cast him out of the city. Um, they threw him out to cast out, eject, to force out, to force away, to expel. And they brought, and that word brought, uh, you can see the definition there. It's to lead away, drive off, conduct with force, drag, hurry away. This isn't a sweet march with soldiers on side by side and everybody in step going together. This is a pushing, shoving, yanking, whatever they can do to get them out of that synagogue, get them out of the city, and get them up the hill. And as I understand it, I think I've seen a, a picture of it that Nazareth is here and it's, on a, it's built on a hill. And you could go up here and you could jump off as long as you had a parachute. Otherwise, you'd be dashed at the bottom of the hill. Now, there's a couple things about this. What Jesus said filled them with rage. On the Sabbath, when you're not supposed to do anything bad at all, and they are going to kill. They are going to murder one of their own. That's what they're going to do. As a group, they decided that. Group brain says, we hate this man. We hate what he says. We reject his words. We don't care what proverb he told us. He deserves to die. And they get him up there. And I've always, always, always been amazed at verse 30. But he, having gone through their midst, went on his way. And that's an imperfect, which means that uh, it, it's not just a picture of him in town here and then walking away. Like, there he goes, bye-bye. He went on his way, and the implication with the imperfect is he never returned. Giving a time flavor of this, after all the events of the temptation, the baptism, the temptation, um, a quick, quick trip uh, up, he moved to Capernaum, he ministered in Galilee, and now this was his homecoming. Kind of a one-time event. One time because they would never get the blessing of his presence ever again. You know, Mark tells us that Jesus was amazed at their lack of belief. Or Matthew. Matthew. Jesus was amazed at their lack of belief. He wasn't able to do anything but heal a, a few sick people. And here, in the uh, other locations, he couldn't, he, couldn't even, he couldn't even get out the door. People were just coming to him to be healed. Uh, his fame went out through all the land. And Nazareth was going to kill him because he claimed to be the Messiah, and they said, we know who you are, and you're not him. I don't care if you never pulled my daughter's pigtails or, or said a curse word or, or never said anything but hello, ma'am. I don't care. You're not the Messiah. You can't be. You're one of us. So we're going to kill you because you said you were. 
They heard Jesus' words. <clears throat> and this is important. They heard Jesus' words. But they rejected who he was. So ultimately, even though they were amazed at his words, they rejected his words because of part of what he said was who he was. They rejected that. They rejected him. And what's sad is their response was rage, and their rage ruined them. God had a plan. And it was for Jesus to die on a cross, not to be murdered by an insane crowd. You'll notice that the, um, on the front of your paper, uh, this is a progressive sermon. The crowd turns from listening to rejecting. And what did their rejection ultimately do. The next page is the crowd turns from rejecting to murder. And I said, not their attempt to murder. In essence, they murdered him with their own hearts and attitudes that very moment. They didn't succeed because God wasn't going to allow them to thwart his will. But it behooves us as God's people to listen to Jesus' words. Verily, verily, is the veracity of what he says, I say unto you, is the authority with which he says it. And we have a Bible full of Jesus' words. It behooves us to pay attention to them. Because in those words are life. As the Gideons of all people know, and anybody who embraces this knows, this has the words of life, and these are his words. Father, we uh, are grateful for all that you've uh, done for us. We have the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We have heard his words, and we believe his words. The Messiah came, and... The beauty is that he's coming again. So, Father, may we be those who uh, embrace Jesus' words and not be like those from Nazareth who rejected uh, both the words of Jesus and his person. May we uh, each day live as if Jesus' life, in a sense, depended on it, and that is the life he has given us to live for him each day. May we be willing to do that. So uh, take us from here, Lord, and may we be faithful servants to you today and in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.